You are listening to True Crime Twins, a true crime podcast hosted by Chloe and Melina Cantor. True Crime Twins is produced by Crawlspace Media. Hello and welcome back to True Crime Twins. I am one of your hosts, Chloe Cantor. Unfortunately, it's just going to be me today. I recorded a great episode, if I do say so myself, with Melina yesterday. And unfortunately, when I came here on my computer to edit today, which is January 27th, so the day before press time, there were some audio issues with the episode. Melina is currently at work. She's nursing it up, slay girl boss. And I'm going to have to fly solo, so I'm sorry that it's just going to be one true crime twin today. But I really didn't want to just skip over this episode because it's a case that I really wanted to use our platform to discuss. It is that of the untimely death of 23-year-old Lauren Smith Fields of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Lauren was a cosmetology student. She died on December 12th, 2021, in her apartment on Plymouth Ave in Bridgeport. So this is a very recent death. Lauren was a graduate of Stamford High School in Connecticut, and she was a track star. She was, at the time of her death, attending Norwalk Community College to be a cosmetologist. She was already kind of showing her skills in cosmetology on her YouTube channel. And I'm not exactly sure how the channel is pronounced, but it's four words, first word bomb, second word W-I, the next word is C-A, last word bag. So I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. I don't know exactly if those are abbreviations, but that's her YouTube channel. She did hair tutorials. She would show how to dye and apply wigs. She was also an influencer with a decent following on Instagram and on TikTok. I believe that since her death, Her TikTok might have been deleted, and some of her YouTube videos have been deleted. I don't know why or how, but you can still find some of her content in her Instagram, I believe, is still active. Lauren was an absolutely gorgeous young lady. She was a Black woman. Lauren was full of potential. She was an avid traveler. Based on her Instagram, she had visited London, Rome, Jamaica, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, in the Dominican Republic. Her profile shows a stunning, vivacious, confident, fun-loving woman who really made the most out of her life, and she honestly looks like she could have been a model. Just absolutely stunning. Six days before her death, Lauren made her last Instagram post where she posted a series of selfies with the caption, self-destructive. Emergency responders were called to Lauren's apartment by an older white man whom she had met on Bumble, which is a popular dating app known for its formula where women make the first move. Men don't send the first message, women do. So it's appealing to some women. This man reported that Lauren was unresponsive. First responders arrived and Lauren was dead. Despite Lauren's family's concerns about this man, the police did not detain him for questioning. Initially unnamed, this man was called a, quote, nice guy by law enforcement, according to Lauren's brother, Lakeem Jetter. They told him that they were not suspicious of the date and that he needn't be investigated, which the family took great issue with. It has since been revealed that law enforcement failed to collect evidence from Lauren's apartment in addition to not questioning the man that called it in. Lauren's parents have both commented to the media that detectives in charge of her case have been arrogant, uncommunicative, and condescending toward them. Lauren's mother actually wrote a detailed email to the Bridgeport Police Department citing her concerns and received no response. Bridgeport Councilwoman Maria Pereira publicly implored the department to respond and to apologize to her family. It has since been revealed that the police didn't even call Lauren's family to inform them of her death. They couldn't reach her for a few days, and they were concerned because Lauren was planning on hosting a holiday party at her home. She wasn't responding to messages. They showed up at her apartment, and there was a note on the door from the landlord to call if they were looking for information or trying to contact Lauren. And that's how they found out. So standard procedure clearly wasn't being followed there, and they also felt that the department was being racially insensitive toward them. Once the media started picking the story up slowly, the police released a statement 
stating the following. The Bridgeport Police Department takes these concerns very seriously. The command staff of the Detective Bureau is reviewing the handling of the case to ensure that best practices were and are being followed. It is imperative to note that the death of Lauren Smith Fields remains an ongoing investigation. Our department extends its deepest condolences to the family of Lauren. So that's the statement. It's unclear whether Lauren's mother actually ever received a personal response to her letter. A few media sources picked up the story after the family reached out, and then it kind of blew up on TikTok, which is how I actually heard of it. I didn't hear about it from the news, even though I'm from this area. I heard about it on TikTok, and a campaign was initiated to call the Bridgeport Police Department, implore them to investigate this case, and even ask them what they're doing. And at least from what the comment said, they were inundated with calls from the public. These statements and subsequent actions really weren't taken until there was this public outrage and outcry. Initially, the Office of the Medical Examiner didn't release the ruling of Lauren's cause of death. It was likely that the manner of death was not ruled a homicide because of the family's reaction. The family was demoralized by the Bridgeport police, their handling of the case, and are not convinced of the accuracy of the autopsy report, which was implied to have been a accidental drug overdose ruling. He adamantly disagreed with this. He said, my daughter was not a drug user and I had a second autopsy myself out of pocket because we felt so uncomfortable with how it was handled. The results of the second independent autopsy haven't been released, but the office of the medical examiner earlier this week did release their results, which was as her father implied, an accidental overdose. More specifically, they said that Lauren overdosed on fentanyl, alcohol, promethazine, and hydroxyzine. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid drug. You've probably heard about it pretty frequently in the media these days because not only is it responsible for so many overdose deaths, but it's apparently less expensive than drugs like oxycodone, oxycontin, which are other pain-killing opioids. So certain drugs have been either laced or entirely replaced with fentanyl and people have died of an unintentional overdose. An example of this is Mac Miller, very famous rapper from Pittsburgh who overdosed and the people responsible for dealing him the drugs were held responsible for his death because I believe he thought he was taking oxy and actually ingested fentanyl. So who knows exactly how fentanyl came to be in Lauren's system. Her family didn't believe her to be a drug user. Promethazine and hydroxyzine, and this is from Melina. I'm not going to take credit for knowing about all these medications. She had explained it yesterday, so I learned from her. Promethazine and hydroxyzine are both allergy medications. Someone with anxiety or sleep disorder might be prescribed these antihistamines. Promethazine is also known as visceral and hydroxyzine is also known as Atarax. So maybe you've heard of those medications with those alternate names. Alcohol was also listed. In these articles, we also learn a little bit about what Lauren's date said, who was named as Matthew LaFountain, a 37-year-old design engineer with Times Microwave Systems. Once there was public outcry, they did take LaFountain in and interview him. He said that he had only known Lauren for three days. They met on the Bumble app. He went over to her home where they drank tequila. I believe there were shots and mixers. He said at one point, Lauren became ill from the alcohol and vomited in the bathroom, but then later came back out and continued drinking. He said that they also ate, played games, and watched a movie. LaFountain also claimed that at one point in the evening, Lauren's brother, Lakeem Jetter, visited to pick up a basket of clothing. He said that after Lakeem left, that Lauren went into the bathroom for at least 10 to 15 minutes, which he, quote, thought was odd. Lakeem has said that Lauren seemed totally fine and not overtly intoxicated when he visited. LaFountain said that Lauren passed out on the couch and that he carried her to bed, later joining her in the bed and falling asleep. He said he woke once in the middle of the night and heard Lauren snoring. He then woke up an hour later and Lauren was not breathing and was bleeding from her nostrils onto the bed. According to the police report, LaFountain was incredibly distraught, crying, trembling, 
when he had called this in and according to the observations of the first responders that arrived. Thanks to advocacy from the family and from the public, more action has been taken. The police returned to Lauren's apartment and collected evidence, including the bloody sheets, a used condom, I believe the cups where the alcohol was ingested, and they were launching a criminal investigation to try to determine where Lauren got the fentanyl. It's a little concerning, in my opinion, that they didn't take these actions to begin with. What the unfortunate implication is, is that LaFountain, a white man, his account was taken at face value, while Lauren, the decedent, who couldn't tell her story, who couldn't defend herself, was just kind of disregarded to the point where her family isn't even notified and proper protocol seemingly isn't taken. It's important to highlight this case because so many people of color who go missing and end up killed do not receive proper attention or care, not just from law enforcement departments, but from media sources. The mayor of Bridgeport, Joe Gannam, has launched an internal investigation into the police's response to Lauren Smithfield's death, and the Smithfield's family has hired an attorney who plans on filing a lawsuit against the department accusing them of many things, including racial insensitivity. A quote from Smithfield's family attorney, Darnell Crossland, is as follows. We have seen the amount of resources that have gone to other cases involving missing white women, like Gabby Petito, and we know so many Black women are missing so much in this country. Everyone is speaking out. Everyone is insulted with the way that the Bridgeport police and the Bridgeport city has dealt with us. The family also has plans to hire a private investigator. Crossland also criticized the police for taking about two weeks to collect evidence and for taking that long to launch a criminal investigation. He specifically said that if it were a white victim and a black person on that date, that they would still be in the police station. Crossland also claims that Matthew LaFountain and his family have connections with the Bridgeport Police Department and that the detective in charge of the case has been placed on administrative leave during the investigation by Internal Affairs. And now, a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks for listening to our sponsors. Now back to the show. So moving forward, it seems that there are a couple of things that need to be established. First, there's obvious implications that LaFountain and Smith Fields had sex because there was a used condom and lubricant found at her apartment. It seems that from pretty early on in their date that Lauren was highly incapacitated, drinking to the point of becoming sick and then continuing on, later passing out on the couch. So at what point did they have sex and was Lauren able to consent to that sex? I had also asked Melina about Lauren's nosebleed, whether that was common or not in an overdose death. And she said that it wasn't and that it was probably due to something else if she had ingested a drug through her nose, that could have irritated it. The nosebleed could have been unrelated. She said nosebleeds are quite common, but it's not necessarily something that's caused by an overdose death. The autopsy said that Lauren had no visible blunt force trauma on her body, but Melina mentioned that she could have been hit in the nose without it causing a bruise, but it causing a nosebleed. So the question of what caused her nose to bleed is still unclear. Obviously, if you are being intubated or if someone's performing CPR on you, that might cause a nosebleed. But Matthew LaFountain said that he discovered her not breathing with her nose already bleeding. So that's another question. Next, how did Lauren come to ingest the fentanyl? Who did it come from? The fact that they weren't initially concerned about this is very disconcerting to me, but I'm glad that they're at least trying to figure it out now. I believe that the DEA is involved. It seems that it could have come from her date, Matthew LaFountain. That's a possibility. When they first started talking, she had asked him for $40 to get her nails done and then came over and they were drinking together. That's who she was with that night, but otherwise there's really no indication that he could have been the supplier. Her brother visited her that night, and then she went into the bathroom, according to LaFountain. So it seems that LaFountain is implying that perhaps Lauren was consuming drugs in the bathroom and that maybe that they came from her brother. Again, there's no evidence 
linking the brother to drug dealing or drug use as far as I can tell. Or it could have been someone completely unrelated. But it's really important that this case is fully investigated and that all measures are taken to ensure that Lauren receives justice, however that looks. I anticipate there will be many developments in this case in the coming weeks and months, which we will certainly plan to cover. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of True Crime Twins. If you enjoy our show and look forward to new episodes, please take the time to leave us a five-star rating and review on whatever platform you use to listen. You can follow us on social media, on TikTok, in Twitter, we are at True Crime Twins. On Instagram, we are at True Crime Twins Podcast. You can also email with questions, comments, case suggestions at truecrimetwinspodcast at gmail.com. <laughs>